Hello Fusion 360 fans, I am your host Jason Lichtman and today we're going to be talking about how I designed and manufactured custom 3D printed prescription glasses. Now you might have seen prescription glasses out there that are unique. Today we're going to show you how to design a completely unique pair because it's going to be a pair that you're going to design yourself. Now it comes with a little bit of a backstory. So a little over a year ago, I went to my optician. I got a prescription for new glasses, and I went from store to store looking for a new pair of really cool glasses. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a pair that met all my needs. I couldn't find one that was cool, was unique, and made me look really, really good. So I decided that I would just design my own. After all, I have all the tools that I need to be able to do so. Right? I have Fusion 360. I have access to 3D printing technology, and for you that could be a 3D printer you have at home or a 3D printing house or service bureau that you could send your files to and they'll print it for you. And of course, a local optician to go and make me lenses. So I have everything that I need to be able to make exactly what I want. Now today's tutorial is not exactly a tutorial. Most of our tutorials we're actually going to be designing something live with you on the screen to show you step by step how to go through the entire process. I'll admit that designing your own glasses is a little bit more advanced and as a result is going to take more time than the hour or so that we have together to actually go and design this step by step. So what we're going to do today that's a little bit different is we're going to walk you through the existing file that I have for my glasses and by showing you step by step what I've already done, you'll be able to know what you're going to need to do on your end. So the only difference is I'm not going to actually be drawing the sketches and creating the features myself. I'm going to be walking you through the existing features in this particular file. Now a little bit about the glasses. If you haven't already noticed, I'm wearing them right now. These are 3D printed on a Hewlett Packard Multi-Jet Fusion 3D printer. In my personal opinion, it's the latest and greatest 3D printing technology that's out there. It is a powder-based system, so you're not going to have any issues with overhangs or anything like that. And as a result, I think you're going to find that it's going to print much better than on a traditional FDM or fused deposition modeling 3D printer. Now, at one point, throughout my process, I did actually 3D print this on an FDM. So if you want to be able to compare, you could see that I have this pair right here. Now this happens to be in white, but if you look at these glasses, you're going to see up close, the resolution on this particular print is not nearly as detailed as on this one, right? You have a very big difference. From farther away, I would imagine they're going to look very similar to each other, but up close, this pair is much more detailed, and this is the one that I'm going to want for everyday use. An FDM printer that you might have access to in your own home is going to be great for prototyping, but I don't think you're going to be as happy with them for production use or for everyday use. For that, you might want to send it out to a service bureau, and later on in this video, I'll cover exactly how to do that. So let's jump right into Fusion 360 and walk through this particular file. So on the screen right now, you could see my Fusion 360 up and running. I do have the new user interface loaded. If your screen does not look like mine right now, you should definitely turn on that user interface, the new one, and you could do so under the top right corner under your name, click on preferences, and then under preview, make sure to turn on this UI preview. Excellent. So we're going to jump to the very beginning of this file and start from the beginning. The very beginning of this file starts off with a scan. And in this particular case, the scan is actually a 3D scan of my face. After all, I want these glasses to fit on me perfectly, and I want them to look really good. And a scan of my face is actually the best way you're going to get to be able to see exactly what this is going to look like after you print it. Now, if you don't have a scan of yourself, don't worry. You don't need it. It is something that is definitely helpful, but is not necessary. All right. Next thing I did was I took this scan and I tried to pull information for where my eyes are. And that's important because at the end of the day, I want my glasses to be very clear and knowing where my eyes are relative to the lenses is going to allow me to design those lenses perfectly around my face and around my eyes. So here you're going to see in a moment, I have a sketch. 
And the very first thing I did, we'll actually look at this from a right view, is I showed a line, and this horizontal line goes through the center of my eye, right around here. Perfect. Then I used that sketch to create a plane, and you can see that plane here is the horizontal plane that again goes through my eyes. Next, on that plane, I drew a sketch that shows the position of my eyes. And we'll go and look at it from this view. We'll zoom in just a little bit. And you could see that I drew a circle that is approximately the diameter of my eye. The diameter doesn't really matter. It's more about the position of the very front of the eye or the center of my pupil. I also put the distance from the center of my face to each pupil. That's right here as well as right here. And now I'm good to go. So we'll go and finish that sketch and move on to the next. The next thing I did here in the timeline is I added a couple of planes. I added a plane for the cross section of my left eye as well as another one for the cross section of my right eye. And I allowed myself to be able to move the center of the lens itself relative to my eye if I need to for aesthetic reasons. And you'll see that plane is right over here. Excellent. Now, the next thing I'm going to want to do is be able to bring in other information about the glasses that I know fit me and look really good. So I'm lucky and I also happen to be able to scan my glasses that I knew already fit me well. And if we want to see what those look like in real life, we'll go and swap those out. This is the pair that I'm starting with. And these happen to be Warby Parker Hardys and I happen to love these. And I knew that they looked really good on me, and so I wanted to use this as a baseline for my very first design in trying to design my own glasses. The second pair, or the third pair, or the fourth, any of the pairs after the first, I'd feel a lot more comfortable making a completely new design from scratch. I wanted to make sure that the first one is going to be indicative of something that I know works well. So here you're going to see I have scan data from a pair of glasses that I know already fits me well. This one happens to not be the Warby Parkers. This is a pair of silhouette glasses. And then I'm also adding in scan data from my Warby Parkers. And that's what it looks like right there. Perfect. Now, if you don't have scan data, as I mentioned before, you're perfectly fine. Don't worry, you don't need the scan data. In fact, the scan of the two pairs of glasses that you saw just a moment ago, I didn't actually have those when I first started designing these glasses. And so, oh, hold on a second, I have to switch my camera. It looks like you guys did not see any of that. Just a moment. All right, so let me show that again. So this is the pair of silhouette glasses aligned to my scan of myself. This is the pair of Warby Parker glasses aligned to the scan of myself. And again, if you don't have scan data of glasses, that's perfectly fine. I'll go and hide those and I'll show you that the next thing I did was I brought in an attached canvas. We'll go and show that. And this is showing you a front view picture that I took with my iPhone of the glasses that I like, those Warby Parkers. I also calibrated the image to make sure it's the correct size and then of course positioned it to the best of my ability, centered above the bridge of my nose. I also brought in other images of the same glasses. I brought in a side view. We'll go and actually show that next. And we'll hide my scan. Sorry, I brought in the top view of those same glasses. And then I also brought in a side view. We'll go and show that. And now you could see that all I really need is a front view, side view, and top view of the glasses to go and be able to design my own. Perfect. So the next thing we're going to do is create a few sketches that are going to drive the majority of our file. This first sketch here is what I call a master sketch, and it's a side view of the profile of the lens. Now, the reason that this is important to start off with is because the lens itself is going to be important that it fits properly in the glasses. Now, I had to do some research, and this is what I found out. I found out that most glasses out there are designed based on looks, and then the optician who's actually going to go and put the lenses in, they go and pick whichever lens is the closest match to the wrap, which is the uh, shape of the frame from above. Actually, let me go and show you that a little bit better. Let's go and look at that top view. Hold on just a moment. There we are. So this curve that you could see here, this is called the wrap. 
And what they're doing is they're picking a lens that has the closest shape to that wrap and they're putting it in your frame. And what happens is that because they don't exactly match perfectly, your frame is actually going to uh, bend or twist so that it accommodates the shape of the lens. And that makes a lot of sense because the lens is actually a thick, hard material. And the frame, even though it might look in your hands like it's relatively hard, is actually a lot more flexible than the, than the lens itself. If you look at these glasses, these are 3D printed, also on the Hewlett Packard. I was trying out different colors, and you could see some different color options here. And if you look at this, it actually bends quite a lot. There's a lot of flexibility here. It's only once you put the lens in the glasses that it becomes much more rigid. And so this is the same pair of glasses that I have on. This was the very first iteration. And this one has a lens blank in it. So this is a lens that doesn't have a prescription. And you can see that this one is not going to bend the way that the other does. It's a lot more rigid. All right, so let's go back to our file here. So again, you have this wrap. And you have the curvature of the lens. And there are several options. They call them base curvatures. They choose whichever one matches. And then the frame twists or contorts to the shape of the lens. Now, what I want is exactly what I see on my screen to be in real life. So for me, the best way to do that is to make sure that the shape of the frame, the wrap that we talked about, is going to match the curvature of the lens. So let's go and take a look at that. We're going to look at it from a right view. And here, you could see that I have a couple of different arcs. The very front one represents the front of the frame itself, that front surface. This one here is the front of the lens that's going to go inside the frame. This one here is the back of the lens going inside the frame. And this is the very back of the frame itself. Now, the position of these arcs is based on the center of my eye, up and down. That's why we created that plane earlier. And then the position of this left to right is based on the other plane that I had created earlier. I'll go and show that just a moment here. And that's this one. And again, I gave myself the ability to tweak this left to right as needed for aesthetic purposes. But the ideal clarity of your lens is when the very center, center of the lens matches up with the center of your eye. So just keep that in mind. So I drew these arcs. Oh, and you must be wondering, how did I decide the size of these arcs? Well, remember how I said earlier that there are different curvatures of the lens? Well, you can take your glasses to any eye store you'd like, and they could put a little tool on the lens surface, and it'll tell them what the base curvature is of that lens. Now, again, I was basing my design off of these Warby Parkers, so all I had to do was take this to my optician, ask them what base curve they were using on this, and I know, because I'm not changing much on the design, that I could use the same base curvature. In this particular case, it's a base 4 curvature, and I can use that throughout my design. The next thing you're going to want to know, though, is how do you translate a base 4 curvature into an actual radius with like a number? So I did some research online, and it turns out that as long as you're using metric, like you know, millimeters as your units, you take 530 and divide it by your base curvature, in this case 4, and that's going to give me the radius of this particular arc. So let's go back and you'll see here that I was able to set my radius based on that and it's set to 132.5 and all I did here was use a parameter for my parameter table that says take 530 divided by the base curve which I set to 4 and it calculates this to be 132.5. Perfect. So that's going to cover the shape of the lens itself. Now, it's still not 3D, it's just 2D in a sketch form. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a front view that's going to drive the entire aesthetics of my design. So let's go and look at that. I'm, of course, only modeling half of the design because I can always take advantage of mirroring so that I get the other half and it's always symmetric. This is going to save me a whole lot of time in the design process. If I want to show my scan data, here you could see what it's going to look like on my own face. And if you don't have that scan data and you just want to compare this to the attached canvas, this is what it looks like. And I essentially traced the image that I already had of my Warby Parkers. Excellent. This area down here 
I ended up adding later on and you'll see why in just a little bit because I wanted to change the surface on this region here and I found it easier to go back and edit my sketch and add this region. Again, this will make more sense in just a little bit. I also, by the way, for the same reason, took this arc and I also extended the straight lines and again, that's going to be later on, you'll see why I was able to do that or why I did, chose to do that. But overall, this is going to be a master sketch that's going to drive the majority of our aesthetic intent for our particular design. Excellent. Next thing we're going to go and do is we're going to go and take those sketches for the lens and we're going to go and turn those into surfaces. So I would used the extrude, not the extrude, the revolve command and I, I revolve the front surface of my lens and I also revolve the front surface of my frame. And you can see that right here. I use the offset command to take the front surface and offset it to make the rear and you'll see that here. This is the back surface of my frame. And then the next thing I did was I added two more sketches. We're going to go and create a sketch for the top view of this design. Let me go and hide these bodies and this will be a little bit more clear. You could again see the center of my eyes, but here you could see that I also designed the nose bridge and I started to design the overall shape of the arm, at least from the aesthetic sur surfaces. So you're going to see that here as well. I then also use the project command to create a sketch that's on the front surface of my frame. We'll go and uh, show those bodies right here so that I can go and make my nose bridge. The nose bridge itself was made using a sweep command. I'll go and show that here. And we'll go and hide everything that we don't need. Perfect. So here you can see, actually I'll hide my sketch as well. Here you could see a surface that I swept along the surface of the front of the frame using that arc for the nose bridge. And then now I'm going to do a little bit of trimming my surfaces to merge them together. So here you're going to see an extend command as well as a few trim commands and then a stitch to stitch everything together. And now I have the front surface of my frame including the nose bridge. Next thing I'm going to go do is create a very simple sketch that represents a square of an area that I care about in my design so that I can go and trim the top and the bottom. We'll go and trim that right here. And now I can go and add a fillet between that connection. And lastly, I can thicken that surface. And now you'll see that I now have a thickened front frame. Again, if you want to see that relative to my scan data, you could see it looks like this. And I know that at this point it doesn't really look like much, but these are the steps along the way to get to the pair of glasses. The next thing I'm going to go and do is I'm going to go and create some surfaces that are important. We'll go and actually hold on just a moment. We'll go and see what I did there. So what I did was I created some profile surfaces using the sketch from the front view. And then I used the split face command to go and split the face of my frame using both the outer profile and the inner for the lens. And so if we go two steps forward and I hide these bodies, now you'll see that the frame actually has the split face command. Now, there are a variety of different ways you could have done this, or rather I could have done this. I could have used the split body command instead of split face. That's a good way to do it, but I chose to do split face on purpose. And this is going to get you to the point where we're going to show you the first tip of the day. And if you didn't know this tip and you learned something, then I'm going to ask you to type into the comment section that you've learned something new. Okay? And so what this is, is we're going to use the press pull command. And actually, I'll show you this live and then we'll go ahead and I'll delete my feature and show you the original. I'm going to use the press pull command and I'm going to select, let's say, this lens region right here. And when I select that region and I drag my arrow, it's going to go and create an offset face. Now, what's special about offset face is that these surfaces, let me actually go and hit OK. These surfaces that were created around everything that I had selected before, these are actually normal to this exterior surface and this exterior surface and this one. And that's important because it's going to give you a lot more control over being able to create more organic shapes that are a little bit more realistic. 
If I would have just done the split body command using that extruded surface, the resulting sidewalls here would be straight front to back. And instead, I have these surfaces being angled normal to the front surface of the glasses. And that's a lot more realistic. So let's go and delete the feature I just created. If I can get my start menu out of the way, there we go. And I'm going to go ahead one step. And you're going to see that I did exactly this for the exterior. And I did this again on the interior. And you might be wondering why I didn't go all the way through the part. If you try to go all the way through the part, you're more often than not going to get an error. But if you go partially through the part and you use direct editing to go and delete the faces you don't care about, you'll be able to automatically heal and trim your body exactly like I just did here. And the result is going to be exactly what I want. So these surfaces along the perimeter of my part are normal to the front surface of my part. And the same thing is true for the lens groove that you see right here, or at least the recess for the lens. And now this is looking really good. This is looking quite good. I'm actually very happy with this. The next thing we're going to go and do, actually let's go and hide our scan data, is I used an extrude command on this region of the part. Let's go and take a look at that. Actually, we'll go one step back. If you recall, I added a piece of my sketch right over here. If we go and look at that front view, I added this triangular region. And I did this because I found that when I was using the offset command to give me those um, normal surfaces around my part, I found that the inner area over here was looking a little funny. So I actually wanted that region intentionally to be straightforward front to back. And so by doing it this way, I can actually go and extrude, cut this region. And now I have just this region being extruded front to back. And then I can go and add a fillet on this corner right over here, that edge, and combine the normal surface to the extruded straight front to back surface. And now this is looking exactly what I would like. Perfect. Next thing I did was I used the thicken command on one of those revolve surfaces that we had earlier. And that's going to result in a 3D model for my lens. Here you could see that lens. But at this point, that lens is not trimmed, right? Because in real life, those lenses come as blanks. And then they're trimmed to the shape of your glasses. And so I'm designing it exactly like that. So I'm starting off with the overall shape. And then I'm going to go and trim it to the correct size. The next feature I have here is going to go ahead and create an offset. And this offset, we'll go and edit this, you could actually see what I did, is I chose the inner surface of my glasses where my lens is going to go. But I also added a little bit of an overlap because I wanted to make sure that I'm going to be able to have a nice and tight fit between my lens and my glasses, my frame. So here I have my offset. And then I'm going to go and use that to go and use a split body command. Actually, I believe I use split face here. And then we're going to go and remove what we don't want. And here I have my inner lens. And right now it's hard to see because it's semi-transparent. But I could also come in here and maybe change the appearance. For just a little while, we'll make that red so you can actually see that more clearly. If we are looking inside this set of frame and glasses. The edge of the lens right now is actually a hard edge. It doesn't have any chamfer on it. And so at some point, I'm going to want to go and add that so that the, the lens is actually going to fit inside my groove. So let's go and add that. Here I have a chamfer. And I used a 45 degree chamfer for my lens. And what I resulted in is a nice sharp point between the front and the back. And this was, by the way, recommended to me from my optician that I was using, which is Optique of Denver. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in just a little bit. So here I have my chamfer. And if I look back at my frame, I don't have any groove for that lens. So the next thing I'm going to want to do is use the combine command to, to take the frame and cut away the lens. So we'll go and do that. And now you could see that same groove is now in my frame. And again, what I did here, we'll go and edit it so you could see it, is I'm messing with the frame geometry and using the lens as my tool. But I don't want the lens to go away completely, so I'm choosing to keep the tool so that it doesn't go away. 
perfect. And so now I have a groove that'll fit that lens perfectly. Excellent. Next thing I have here in my file is quite a few different things. We'll actually go and show that. And this is primarily going to be talking about the nose pad of my, of my glasses. Because if I just put this on as is, it might not be the most comfortable. So for the nose pad region, the first thing I did was create a sketch. And this sketch is showing me, let's go and zoom in here from the back. There we are. A line right here and a line right here of where I want the nose pad region to start and where I want it to end. Then I went ahead and I used the split face command twice, once for right here and once for right here to split those faces. And then I used the delete face command to remove that region. Let's actually go and zoom in properly. There we go. And now you could see that I converted my solid model into a surface model. And so I'm definitely going to have to patch this all up to convert it back into a solid. Next thing I did here was I created a couple of, of different planes that I thought would be helpful to me. I created a plane on that line that we used to, to split our face and another one on this line. And then I also created a parallel plane right down the middle that I'm going to use to figure out how much of a bump out I want on my nose pad. Let's go and show a sketch that I created here. And what this is showing me is it's controlling how much of a bump out do I want. And this line here is really what I'm using to control this. I then use the loft command from this edge to this edge going through that line. And you could see that I'm able to control that by adjusting the height of that line as well as being able to go into the loft command and changing how much tangency I have, the, the tangency weight as we'll call it, from profile one or profile three. Profile two is the center and that's exactly this bump out that was controlled by the sketch. Now if I just use this surface and I healed everything up, I don't think it would look how I want it. I want it to also curve inwards because that's what I see on the real glasses. So we'll go here and look at it and you could see if you look really closely that it actually curves inwards as it goes around my nose and that's exactly what I wanted. So we're going to go back to Fusion and I'm going to show you how I did that. The next thing I did was I extruded some surfaces I took that surface that we lofted and I extruded it, sorry, I extended it in width so that I don't have to worry about how much area it covers. And then I went ahead and I created some new surfaces that you're going to see here in just a moment. And we're going to go and move those into position. So first thing I did was I created these vertical walls and then I moved them into position slightly and you'll see where I move them. This one is actually the same as this wall over here, but it's moved up and over. This one is actually the same as this wall over here, but again, it's moved up and over. And the reason I did that is because next thing I could do is I could loft from the original top edge to this new top edge, and then the same thing on the inner side from the original edge right over here to this new top edge, and the reason I did it this way is because by using the original surfaces, I'm going to get a much smoother shape because the shape that's being lofted at the bottom is going to end up with a very similar shape at the top because after all, they're actually the same surface just moved over. And I did use again my tangencies to control how that's being manipulated. And then the next thing I could do is I could actually start to remove the extra surfaces I don't need and start to trim and stitch things together. And as this starts to come together, I think you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So here I now have my nose pad and it's able to arc up and in on this side and up and in on this side as well. And now there are a variety of different ways you could do this, including using the sculpt environment, which I think would be very handy for something like this. I happen to choose to use this via parametric surface modeling, but there are a variety of different ways you can do this. And I want you to know that you can try anything you'd like, whatever works best for you, I'm happy with, right? So this is the way that I happen to model my nose bridge. And again, I don't have any fillets here at this point. Once I do have fillets, this is gonna look a lot more organic and a lot more comfortable on my face as well. 
Next thing we're going to do here is start to design the arms. So let's go ahead one step, two steps actually, and here I have a sketch of what I want the arm to look like from above. This is partially driven by our earlier sketch that was driving the outside edge, but this sketch also includes the inside edge of my arm, and it also includes a lot of detail about the hinge. And we'll talk a little bit about the hinge in just a few minutes, and we'll go back to the sketch at that point, but just be aware that the hinge as well as the arms are all covered in the same sketch. Perfect. I also went ahead and I drew the arm from a side view. So we'll go and look at that here. Here you could see a side view of my arm as well as the back end. And I'm controlling all of this using sketches. You could see, sorry, using dimensions and constraints. You could see that I didn't fully constrain this particular sketch. I probably should have. That's generally best practice. But you don't have to, right? So if you're an industrial designer and you prefer to design a little bit more nimbly and not be subjected to a full amount of constraints and dimensions, you don't have to. So via these two sketches, I went ahead and I created a couple of additional planes that I thought would be helpful. And then I went ahead and I extruded the shape of the arm from the side. And I intentionally extruded this a little bit too much. Then I could go ahead and use another extrude using the intersect feature. I'll go and show that right here. I'm using the vertical or the top view sketch as well as the intersect operation to say I only want to keep what's intersected between the two. And now I'm starting to see an arm that's looking pretty good. Excellent. Now the next few features that I have in here are surface offsets and surface extends. And this is a little bit more advanced, but the reason that I created this was due to some issues that I encountered later on when I was doing things like extruding the logo and adding other little bits and pieces. So I ended up adding this later. I didn't initially think that I was going to need or want this stuff, but I ended up adding it and it proved very useful. And we'll go and show that in just a little bit and why those ended up being important. The next thing I did was I added a chamfer and I did that to the very back end. You could see that right here. So I just chamfered off that little bit. And then I went ahead and I created quite a few sketches to be able to manipulate the very top surface of the arm. And the reason that I did that is because when I first 3D printed my glasses, using the HP printer, although I happen to be a big fanboy, one of the things that is possible with the Hewlett Packard is to have a little bit of sync in your parts because their process is very much heat dependent. And so the very first frame that I printed had a little bit of sag on this top surface and I was able to design around it by instead designing it to be bumped out a little bit. And I'll show you that. I'll skip ahead so you could see what that looks like. And although it's minor, I designed a slight bump out so that even after the sink, the worst I'm going to get is perfectly flat as opposed to sinking concave up. So all I did there was loft a few cross sections with an arc to be able to modify the top region of my glasses to give that little bump out. And that typically happens on the Hewlett Packard with the very top surface of the part when it's oriented in the machine. Again, you don't need to make these changes, but if you want to, you can, of course. The next part here is actually quite important. And this is an area where I use the replace face command. Now let's go and zoom in here and you can see that I have quite a few issues with the way that the arm intersected with the frame. So these replace face commands were actually vital to getting a nice perfect match between the, the two different parts. If we skip ahead one step, you'll see that I did a replace face and I replaced this surface of the frame with the side of the arm. So now that they met, now they match perfectly. I did another replace face and you could see that at the very bottom. Let me go and show that one more time. And I changed the very bottom surface of the frame to match the bottom surface of the arm. Perfect. I do this again and I do a replace face and I make it so that the front of the arm, let's go and show that one more time. We'll go back one step. The front of the arm was intersecting or interfering with the frame. They were taking up the same space. That's a problem, big problem. So I used replace face and I replaced the very front of the arm, this surface, with the very back of the frame. You could see that there. And now these are butting up against each other perfectly. This is looking really good. Cool. So the next step is going to be adding the hinge. And let me tell you a little bit about these hinges. So 
Most glasses, as I'm sure you've already seen, they have metal hinges. And the metal hinges are nice and strong and they are adjustable. And the way that most glasses are made, or at least for acetate frames like this, is they take these metal hinges, they heat them up, and while they're super hot, they push them into the acetate, which melts the acetate, and then the acetate kind of melts around the metal hinge, and they're stuck in place. Now, other hinges can be screw-in hinges, where they're screwed on the outside of the arm and also on the front of the frame. And th those are the kinds of glasses you might see that have two dots on the front, front of the frame. I didn't want to have either. In fact, I didn't want any metal hinges at all because 3D printing is so versatile that you can actually 3D print everything together. You don't need to have any metal hinges whatsoever. And I've never seen any 3D printed glasses out there that don't have any metal hinges, so I wanted to be the first. So today, I'll show you how I did that part. I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit so you can see what the final result is gonna look like. And that, I think, is gonna help you imagine what we're doing here. So what I have, actually we'll skip quite a bit ahead so you can actually see this moving. Just a moment. Perfect. So here, oh, and I have to add my joints. Give that just a moment to load up. Computing our fillets and then our joints and then this will all make perfect sense. So. The inspiration for this particular hinge is a simple door hinge. You have a pin and you have two different parts that the pin goes through and you're able to have this perfect rotation motion. And in our case, I didn't want to have a separate pin. I wanted the pin to be part of the glasses. In this case, the front frame. And so I can have that really easily here. And you can see that I have the arm able to rotate. And what I have here is a simple pin right down the middle and a little feature that's holding the pin on the top and bottom of the frame. And then on the arm itself, all I have is a hole, a donut shape with a hole in it. Now, you do have to get this perfect so that it actually works properly. You need to have the right spacing between the two and the right tolerance, the right tolerance is the right spacing, but you need to have all of this figured out. And these numbers might change depending on whether you're trying to 3D print this on an FDM printer or you're trying to print this on the HP like I did. If you look at my initial print, these white frames here, this arm actually doesn't bend. And the reason it doesn't bend is because the very first hinge broke instantly. So I ended up hot gluing, not hot glue, crazy gluing this hinge back together so that I could actually put these on and make sure that it fit me and looked good. But the first one broke and I knew that I needed to make it more rigid. I needed to make it more sturdy. And so I actually took this design and then I updated it so that it would be a lot stronger. And we'll go and take a look at that. Perfect. So the design here is really simple. You have a donut and you have a pin. And so let's go back and see how I did that. I think we are right about here. All right, actually a little bit further back. Excellent. No, even further. There we are. So in that sketch that I showed earlier, you're gonna see that I had a whole lot of really cool stuff in there. We're gonna go and look at that right now. We have our sketch for the arm shape, top view, and we'll go and edit that. And what I did here is I designed it so that I have the initial, the, sorry, the pin on the very inside. I have a slight gap between the two parts, and then I have my ring that goes around it, and I also drew in the supports. And you'll see those lines right here, as uh, yeah, those as well as these lines right here. Now this sketch is a little bit messy, but keep in mind that as of our recent update, you can actually turn off all the dimensions to be able to see this a little bit more clearly. You can also go and show or hide all the constraints at once so that again, you can make even a complicated sketch and still be able to edit it without being overwhelmed by all the dimensions or all the constraints. So the gist of it here is that I have my pin and I have my donut around it and I positioned it in such that I would end up being able to maximize the size of the pin 
the size of the donut and still have it be out of the way so that I don't see the actual hinge through my own glasses because that would drive me crazy. I wouldn't want that. So there we have our sketch. I started off by extruding the pin itself. I also extruded the very bottom, the support, as well as the very top, and then combined them together. And then I went ahead and I modeled the donut around that same part, and then I combined that with the arm itself. Now, once I did that, let's actually go and look at this again. Then I ended up needing to do a whole lot of offset commands to be able to make sure I had enough clearance. Because at this point, I actually have an interference between my hinge and my frame. So the first thing I did, and actually we'll go back one step and it'll make more sense. Here I have that interference. Then I used the combine command and I took the front frame and I subtracted the arm from it. And now I don't have interference, but I still don't have a gap. I want that gap to be there as well. So the next thing I did was I used the offset command or rather the press pull command that brought in offset surfaces. And then I create all of the different tolerance that I need between the parts. That's like kind of a quick and dirty overview of how I created that particular section. And once I've done that, then I'm gonna to wanna to go ahead and create sketches for some of the more ornamental features. Because after all, I want these to look really cool, so I wanted to put in a logo as well. If we look at this from a side view and we zoom in, you'll see that I created a space for a recess. And you can see that right here. This is the recess that I wanted in my particular arm. And then I also went ahead and I created a logo. And if you haven't already seen this in the pictures, my logo is a wise wizard logo. And you won't find that anywhere else. This was something that I created for myself. I thought it would be really cool to be the wise wizard. This is not a reference, by the way, to Harry Potter, although Harry Potter is an excellent book series as well as movie series. This just doesn't happen to be a reference to Harry Potter, even though you'll see a lightning bolt in just a moment. But here we have our Wise Wizard logo. This was brought in as a DXF via insert DXF, right over here, insert DXF, and then placed in the right location. And then I went ahead and I did the same thing for the Wise Wizard logo in the opposite direction. And the reason I did it that way is because, after all, once I mirror my arm over to the other side, the text is going to be mirrored as well. So I'm going to want to go and flip the text so that I get the proper logo on both sides. We'll skip ahead just a little bit here. And what you're going to see in a moment is going to be that we're going to go ahead and mirror some of those surfaces as well. And next thing we're going to do is we re cut out our recess for my logo. I'll go and hide my sketches. Here we are. I cut out my recess for the logo. I then went ahead and put the logo in. And I did have a little bit of issues with the letter D. Something was wrong with the Illustrator file that I brought in. So I went and cleaned that up. And then, of course, combined it with my arm. I also went ahead and drew a sketch for the lightning bolt that I wanted on the interior of the arm. And again, I extruded that on the inside. So here you can see the little lightning bolt. Again, not Harry Potter reference, although I could see where someone might say that. At this point, my glasses are looking really good. And so what I'm going to do next is start to do fillets. And fillets always come at the end. That's the best time to do it. So here I have a little folder of fillets that are all on the arm. So I filleted all the different edges except for the Wise Wizard logo that I wanted to be nice and crisp. And that does include edges of the hinge itself. You can see that right there. I then also did the same thing for the frame. And with all the fillets, it's starting to look a little bit more natural and a little bit more organic looking. In particular, the nose bridge that we talked about earlier is now looking really, really good and really realistic. So I like that. So here I have all my fillets. Next thing we're going to go and do is we're going to go and mirror all of our components. Now, the first thing I did was I took my arm and I turned it into a component. I then added a joint. In this case, it was an as-built joint so that I could now go and move my arm and start to rotate it and see what it's going to look like in real life. I then went ahead and mirrored my actual frame. And then I combined the left and right half of the frame together. So now I have a single frame that's mirrored about the center line. I also went ahead and mirrored my lens. So now I have the right lens as well as the left. 
and I went ahead and I mirrored the component for the arm. And remember how earlier I talked about how the sketch for the logo is going to end up, I needed to bring in two sketches because the logo is going to end up being backwards? Well, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Because I mirrored the entire component, the Wise Wizard logo itself is now also backwards. So I'm going to want to go ahead and fix that. At this point, the right arm doesn't have any joints on it. It's actually free to move in space. But I don't want it to move while I'm going ahead and fixing it. So I actually use the ground option. I right clicked on my arm and I said ground this. So temporarily, this will not move. I then went ahead and we'll zoom in so you could see it. I got rid of the Wise Wizard logo using delete. I simply selected all the surfaces and hit the delete key on my keyboard. And then I went ahead and I extruded the logo in the correct orientation for here. I also did the same thing for the lightning bolt on the inside. I also wanted that to be correct. And so now I have the lightning bolt also. The other thing that I did here was I added designed in Fusion 360 onto my part because I wanted to, to really show off that you could design something as complex as prescription glasses that look like you could go and buy them in the store. And you could design all of that in Fusion 360, no problem. So here I have my Fusion 360 logo, uh, sorry, my designed in Fusion 360 text using the same font as the Wise Wizard logo. And I did also have an issue with the letter D extruding. You probably noticed that a few moments ago, and you can see that I ended up extruding the letter D separately and then cleaning that up. Once I've done this, now I want to be able to move the right arm as well. So I use the unground command. You could see that right here. Now the arm is free to move again. And then I used another as-built joint to now be able to have motion on this right arm. So we can go and grab that right arm and move that. I also turned on, I enabled contact sets. So now when I go and I move the arm, it'll actually stop when it hits the other different components. So I could see what in real life is going to happen when I start to go and bend my arms and things like that. Perfect. So in this case, you know, we designed all the way from start to where we are right now, all in Fusion 360. And now we want to go ahead and 3D print this. Well, Fusion 360 makes 3D printing really easy. You can go under Tools, and you could select 3D Print, and then select your object that you want to 3D print, and we'll send it straight to the slicer of your choosing, whether that's Cura or that's Netfab or one, uh, any other slicer that you'd like, no problem. You can also uncheck this box for send a 3D print utility, and we'll give you an STL file that you could send elsewhere. Now, I mentioned earlier that I tried 3D printing this on an FDM printer, and although the results fit me well, I just didn't think that they were the right kind of quality that I wanted for every day. And so I ended up sending this to a Hewlett Packard printer. Now, I ended up sending this to a local, a local 3D printing house called Avid Product Development. They're in Loveland, Colorado, and they are fantastic. Doug Collins, the owner, is a genius, mechanical engineer by background. He is a wizard in CAD, and then also fantastic at 3D printing. So they have, at this point, two of these Hewlett Packard printers. They're located only an hour north of where we live in Denver, uh, or sorry, rather, where I live in Denver. And so I send a lot of my 3D prints to him. You could, of course, do the same. In addition to being able to send it to Avid Product Development, there are 3D printing bureaus out there that are, I highly recommend. Websites like Fictive.com, that's F-I-C-T-I-V.com, as well as QuickParts.com, as well as Shapeways.com. And all of them will allow you to select that you want to print your design on a Hewlett Packard as well, as well as a variety of other designs. You don't, sorry, other 3D printing technologies. You don't have to use the Hewlett Packard if you don't want to. But just know that you, even if you don't have access to one of these machines in your own home or at your office, you can still send these files out. The cost of 3D printing a pair of glasses like these or the ones that I'm wearing was only about $20 each. Right? There is a minimum order, so you might want to print multiple things together, but it was only $20 each for these glasses, which is quite affordable, which is also how I was able to print multiple different versions to be able to test this out and really get a feel for what's going to work the best. 
Now, if you looked closely at the inner left arm of the glasses right here, you'll see that this is actually version 63. And uh, so that means that I spent quite a bit of time designing these and then tweaking them to get them how I wanted. But in the end, I can't be happier. Um, this is, these glasses are fantastic. So now the question becomes, how do you go and take the 3D printed frames like these, right, with no lenses in them, as you could tell right here, and how do you get lenses put in? So I went over to my friends at uh, Optique of Denver, right here in Denver, you can go and find your local optician and your optician can take your frames and they can make you lenses. Now most opticians don't actually have a lens laboratory in-house. So what they do is they ship the, the frames to the lab and the lab is going to go and trace those frames and make the lenses for you and then ship them back. That's typically why the lead time is something like three to five weeks when you order glasses. I found Denver, uh, Optique of Denver rather, because they have their own laboratory in-house. And so I got to work with them to make sure that this was going to fit and also follow along with the process quite a bit. So I'm going to bring up my screen here and I'm going to show you a little bit about my experience over at Optique of Denver. What we did was we started with a lens blank and this is what a lens blank looks like. Some of the lens blanks start off uh, with no prescription and then they grind the prescription into the back. In this case, what Optique of Denver does is they buy the blanks that already have the prescription included. So it makes it a little bit easier for them. They don't have to do the grinding on the back side of the lens. The next thing they're going to do is they're going to go and put this lens blank in a fancy machine. And the machine that you see, it's actually two machines. The one on the right, this one right here, is going to be the tracing machine. The one on the left is the grinding machine. First step is to use the tracer to figure out the shape that they need to make the lens. And then they're going to take those lenses, they put it in the grinder, and the grinder is going to grind it to that shape. The person that you see on the screen right now is not me. That's Marshall over at Optique of Denver, and he is absolutely fantastic. If you live in the Denver area, I highly encourage you to not only use this particular optical store, but also Marshall in particular. He is the greatest. I can't thank him enough. Let's actually watch a quick video that's going to show you what we do to trace those lenses. Actually, before I show you that video, let me also show you this quick picture. What they did was they took my glasses, they put them on my on my face and then they put this really fancy fixture, I will call it, on my face and it has all these green dots. They used an iPad to take a picture of me wearing this thing and based on the distances between all of those green dots it pulls a whole lot of useful information that they could then plug into the grinding machine to get the position of the center of the lens right and all of the other optical qualities. Now, some important things to note here are going to be that the left, or it's, I guess it's my right eye, you'll see that I have two different pupils. My eye is actually behind a really cool prism, it's like a glass prism, and as the light is reflected through that prism, it shows two pupils, and the distance between the center of these pupils, believe it or not, is actually the distance from the frame backwards to my eye. That's pretty cool. So they're able to figure out that distance. And you'll see a lot of the information that they were able to pull up is all shown at the very top. So you have the distance between the center line and my pupil. Here it's calculating as 29.6. I used 29 when I did my design. Here you're seeing 30.4 in their calculation and I again used 29 on my side. You'll also th see things like the wrap angle of 7 and that's exactly what I used on my end as well as other frame measurements here including this which is called the pentascopic angle and that's the angle of your glasses as seen from the side. So if we go back into Fusion and we look at this from the right view, let's go and zoom in here, you could see this angle that we have here, it's not perfectly vertical and I set mine to two and a half degrees and in the video, uh, sorry, in this picture, you could see that they went and measured it as 2.3 degrees. So all in all, what this is telling me is that my design and the computer and the 3D print that I ended up with matched really well. So I'm really happy with that. I'm actually really, really happy with it. And I'll also tell you that I was blown away that 
Optique of Denver actually had the system because I've used a lot of other opticians to get frames made for me and no one else has used this. So Optique of Denver is really at the forefront of technology in my opinion to be able to get you the absolute best lenses possible for your glasses. All right, so now let's get into the really good stuff. We're gonna hit play here on this quick video and what you're gonna see is the tracing process. And you take the glasses, part in the video is super skippy right now, it wasn't right before my live stream, but what we do is you take the glasses and you put it in the machine and this little pin sticks up and it traces around that groove that we created in the frame. And it traces all the way around, it goes back down, it goes across, back up, and then it's going to do the same thing one more time. And this is essentially tracing that groove to give a 2D representation of what that shape and size is. And you're going to see that here in just a second on their screen. And then I'll go and show you a little bit more polished picture. And again, this is showing the exact shape so that they could send that over to their grinder. Now, Fusion 360 is fantastic at designing parts as well as creating things like toolpaths. But what these guys are doing is using a very specialized software to trace the, the frame and then automatically send all the toolpaths and G code to their grinder, which is a very proprietary grinder. But this is what you're getting as a result of the tracing. They set a bunch of different options on what kind of frame you're using, whether the frame is plastic or whether it's frameless, and what kind of lens you're using, and it changes a bunch of different settings. Again, some of that data came from the picture I showed earlier with all those green dots. Then we're gonna go ahead and send it over to our grinder. <coughs> Excuse me. The grinder, what it's doing right now is it's running through the entire G code of the grinding, but it's not actually grinding. It's just verifying that all the areas we're trying to grind are on the surface of the lens because these lenses are expensive and they don't want to waste them by accidentally misaligning the lens to the axis that you see there. <coughs> Excuse me. So that was a quick verification. Now the grinder is going to turn on, including coolant, and it's going to start to grind the lens. And then after it grinds the lens to the overall shape, it's then going to move it over and it's going to buff that edge to make sure that it's not going to be sharp. And it's also going to automatically include that V-groove or that chamfer that I designed earlier. This is exactly why I knew to create that chamfer because I went and I met with Marshall. He showed me how this machine works. I saw the V-groove that was in there. And then based on that, I was able to go and design to accommodate that V-groove. Right? So it's all about being able to understand the manufacturing process that you're actually using. So overall, after we were able to create the lens, all we had to do then was pop those into my frames, just like you see in these. And now these are good to go. And I think these are going to last me a really long time. But if, for whatever reason, at some point in the future, I end up having a problem and I break these frames, well, I already have the file for it, so all I'm going to have to do is send out to get it 3D printed again and take the lenses that I already have send and pop them right into the new frames. That's one of the benefits of 3D printing, besides the fact that I have completely custom glasses that I think are really cool. Now, if you also want to see how you can store those glasses, here you could see a custom case that I designed. This was another live tutorial and we'll include a link to this as well. And so you can go ahead and you could design a case. You could design yourself custom glasses like this as well as a custom case like this and have a completely custom set of glasses. Now we went through a lot today. I want to thank you so much for your time. I hope you learned a lot. Please let me know if you have any questions and have a wonderful day. Don't forget, with Fusion 360 and Autodesk, you can make anything. Thank you.